Well, if you guys will find your seats, we'll get started. Well, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your strength that you give to us. And Lord, I thank you for your word, which is so rich. I pray that you help us as we look at your word, that you might speak to our hearts because we soak in a world that tells us how to think and how to feel. And Lord, quite often we're susceptible to going off track. And I pray that you help us, Lord, that we would be aligned to your kingdom by your word, that your spirit would speak to our hearts now, and that you might change us more into the image of your son. So Lord, this is your day. This is your time. I pray that you would be glorified in us, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, we're back in the book of First Peter. We're going to be in chapter 2. We're going to talk about suffering and submission today. <laughs> and the crowd went wild. <laughs> suffering and submission, two, two categories in which God knows through Peter that we need to talk about. And if you think that you've had it hard and you think you have it difficult, imagine to the group he's writing to. These people are being persecuted to death because they believe in Jesus. And so what we're experiencing and what they've experienced are two different worlds. But this is, uh, this is what God's called us to. And let's, let's take a look at it. If you remember last week, we were talking about the rock. And it was interesting that um, Rocco brought up that song. He's our rock. I just think that's uh, pretty cool. It's almost like you read ahead. Last week, we talked about the milk of the word that we're to desire as newborn babes. The word of God and God speaking to us is something we should desire more than food, more than our daily food is something that we should be interested in because that's what sets our mind, right? That's what satisfies our appetite. It's not going to be anything on your phone. It's not going to be anything in t on TV. It's not going to be anything in this world that is going to satisfy you like hearing the voice of God. Amen. Amen? Amen? And then we know who we are. We know where we're going. And we're to desire it earnestly like a baby desires milk and how they cry out without it. Uh, I don't know. I've seen some people in some really tough moods. I'm not talking about you. Don't get all <laughs> sensitive. Maybe I am, but uh, Okay. And I wonder, have you been in the Word? Because the Word is one of those things that when it washes over you, it, it, you tend to shine, you know, because you know who you are, you know who the Lord is, you know where you're going, you have a sense of purpose, you have a sense of God's love for you, which, I don't know about you, but that's the engine that drives me. It's His, it's his love over us Amen. that is our joy. So... We should desire it and never grow old of it. There's no such thing as growing beyond the essential milk of the scripture. Of course, there's so much more in the word of God. You can get into eschatology, study of the end times. You can look into prophecies. You can get into the minor prophets. There's all kinds of things that you can get involved in and get just overtaken by. But you will never outgrow the milk of the word of God, which is Human beings were created in God's image. We decided to step off. We were disobedient, messed up our DNA. From now on, sin has infected the entire world. Amen? Amen. Including us, and we need a Savior. A long time ago, God predicted that he would send a Savior for us, who was Christ the Lord, Amen. who proved that every word he said was true by rising on the third day, and ultimately rising into heaven, giving us the promise of a new life with him. You will never outgrow that story. And I hope every one of you has that uh, experience. He goes into talking about how we're living stones as Christ is a rejected living stone. And when we come to him, we become a living stone, which sounds like an oxymoron. And we talked about that last week. It's about being part of a building. It's being one of many that fit together. We talked about how the temple is so fit together with those stones. You can't get a credit card between the stones and there's no mortar. It's just stone upon stone. 
It's an amazing thing. And I imagine Peter is thinking about the temple because he's referring to our us as the temple of God, as God's building. So I, ma- I can't help but think that that's probably what he, where he's going. The whole body, as we're joined and knit together, as each one does what it's supposed to do. I, I was just, uh, I-, I usually do security. <laughs> I-, I stand outside while all the late people come in. They all think that I'm there to see that they're late. I can just see in their eyes. Oh, pastor, good morning. But I'm actually, I usually stand there to say hello to people, but I stand there so that uh, our point of entrance to this place is guarded by someone. And I'm, I'm a pretty large, immovable object, so <laughs> I, I station myself there. And it's not me, it's one of our deacons. Uh, so there are things going on you guys don't know about, probably shouldn't tell you. Anyway. <laughs> The whole body, as everybody does a part, everything gets done. And it was just talking about how beautiful it is to belong to this church. Amen. And I'm very privileged to be your pastor. And I'm, I'm glad that you guys are here. We've got a lot of new people showing up too, which I praise God for. Uh, it's, it's like new spice in a soup. It's good stuff. Anyway, sorry. I'm, I'm waxing non-eloquent. We talked about how we're living stones. We're in the process of being fashioned and created into the image of Jesus Christ so that we fit together with one another. And the more that we mature, the more we become more like Jesus, the more the friction and the heat and the pressure and the sparks will begin to go away and give way to peace and love. And that's the way God's designed it. That's the way he's designed marriage as well. Uh, We'll be talking about that next week in chapter three. So Tune in. Very difficult passage. You want to see your pastor squirm? (laughs) You'll have to wait longer than next week. We talked about the living stone that Christ is, and it's an interesting thing. If you look in the Old Testament, in the book of Numbers, it's recorded about how when they escaped Egypt and they went through the Red Sea and got to the other side, they get to a place where it's dry and there's no water and they're crying out to Moses. Moses, of course, does the right thing, cries out to God and says, God, these people need water. He goes, what I want you to do is go to this stone, this rock, and I want you to smack it. And when you do that, all this water's going to come out of it. And Moses didn't go, yeah, right. He said, okay. And he went and he did that, and all of a sudden, all of this water comes out of this stone, and it, it comes cascading down the hill that you see here. By the way, archaeologists are absolutely amazed that this particular stone is cut directly in half, and it has signs of erosion all around it, like water was running over it. Amazing. <laughs> the miracles that are recorded in the scripture really happened. Amen. Wow. What a discovery. It's like, why don't you read the Bible? Anyway, and it's interesting because the book of Hebrews tells us that this rock was Christ. (coughs) It's a picture of who Jesus is, that when he came the first time, he was struck. And because of that, the living waters now come and fill us. The second time Moses was to just speak to the rock. But he was pretty upset with the people because they were rebels And they were complaining. And so what he did, instead of speaking to the rock, is he smashed it twice out of anger. Because of that, he wasn't able to go into the promised land. I love the beautiful picture, but Jesus, that God caused the water to flow anyway, even though Moses didn't do it in the prescribed fashion. But Moses wasn't able to go into the promised land because he maligned the image of God. God wasn't mad at him. Moses was. And so he took it out on doing something God told him to do. So he did the right thing, but he did it in the wrong way. And he certainly had the wrong heart. You guys relate? You do the right thing in the wrong way and you can really mess it up. So the Lord tells him, go and and get to this rock. He says, take your rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock. This is the second time. And before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water to them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, hear now, you rebels. That's a good way to start a sermon, right? (laughs) 
Must we bring water out of this rock? It's almost like Moses is going to take credit for this thing himself. Must I... Ooh, what? Who? Must I bring water out of this rock? And then Moses lifted his hand and he struck the rock twice with his rod. He was especially angry. And water came out abundantly and the congregation and all the animals drank. This rock in the wilderness, we're told in the book of Hebrews, was Christ. And it says that this rock followed them. You ever been followed by a rock? I know Indiana Jones was, but, uh, you know, that's the only one I know. So we talked about what it is to be rejected and the temple stone that was rejected when they were building the temple and they found it because they dumped it and how Jesus is a picture of what happened there historically, how he was the cornerstone of everything. The cornerstone is what tells you north, south, east, west, where all the walls are going to go, where everything needs to be set up, and you really shouldn't do anything until you get that thing set. Uh, at least that's the way it is when you're building a stone building. And so Jesus is called the cornerstone. Now, he was precious and chosen by God, and yet he was rejected, much like the stone in the temple that they got rid of. We talked about how we are being built up to be these stones that fit together. You ever wonder why your most difficult relationships are the people closest to you? You don't wonder that. Okay, that's good. <laughs> It's because they're the ones who get close enough to you to see your faults and tell you about them. Amen. They're the ones who will see your faults and tell you about them, which causes friction and heat and pressure and sometimes sparks. And yet that's what God has designed to polish us off, to make us more like him. And I'm grateful for that. We're all being built up into a spiritual house where we do worship, we meet with God, we sacrifice, serve, we have fellowship, we hear the word, all of the things that were done around the temple precincts, that is now what God is ministering to our hearts now, individually and corporately here. And so God is speaking to us and raising us up to be this holy priesthood. Now, the priesthood of all believers is something that the New Testament teaches, is that you are a priest. You can get married in this priesthood, it's okay. A priest is somebody that stands before God on behalf of man. That's what a priest does. You pray for your friends. You pray that they might know Christ. You pray that they might learn. You pray that they get off drugs. You pray that they stop beating their wives. You pray, you do all of that, and you stand as an intermediary, and you say, hey, there's a sacrifice made for you. Do you want it? That's what a priest does. And yeah, you can be a girl priest. You can't be a girl pastor over men, but you can be a girl priest. And you can intercede before God on behalf of men. We talked about what are the spiritual sacrifices that a church makes, that a person makes who, who's a believer. And in verse 17 of Psalm 51, David tells us the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. First thing is we have to be humble in our heart and realize we need a savior. We don't have a right to judge other people or look down on them or point a finger at them because you know what? You're made of the same stinky stuff and you're going to get put in the ground like everybody else. I need a savior just like you do. Even, even Mary, the mother of Jesus, she needed him as her savior. I love the words of Mary. In fact, anybody who, who reveres her and, and kind of lifts her up, I say, well, you should do what Mary says. Do you know what Mary said? And they go, And I just let him hang there for a while. I say, <laughs> Mary said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Amen. Those are good words. Amen. You should listen to Mary. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. Very good words. But you have to begin with a humility when we come before God. Before any sacrifices can be made, a priest in the Old Testament would have to wash this special washing. He'd have to change his clothes. There's special stuff he'd have to put on. There are all of these things. There's blood he has to sacrifice for his own sin. Before he goes and sacrifices for other people's, he has to atone for his own. So there's, there's this whole thing. If you read the Old Testament, it's just like, oh my goodness, there's a lot of stuff you got to do. What we do is accept a free gift. 
How easy is that? Jesus Christ died so that we can approach God. Amen. That's it. And it's by faith that we can do that. That's the simplest thing of all. It seems too simple, right? There's got to be a catch. It's like buying a car. This price is too low. You, there's something, you know, there's a balloon payment or something at the end, right? No, that's truly it. But we come before God with that, and we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That, I don't do what I want to do. I don't go where I want to go all the time. I don't talk to the people I want to talk to. Sometimes I have to talk to people I don't want to talk to. How about you? Yeah. yeah. I, I got to get up at certain times in the morning when I want to get up. I got to go to the gym, and I don't want to go to the gym. But if your body is a living sacrifice, you've given yourself over to God. Lord, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. Amen. You say jump, I'll say how high. You see, that is the relationship it should be. Not, hey God, I got a list of things for you. <laughs> you need to get on this right away. And if he doesn't, you get all disappointed and angry and upset. He's doing that so you realize that's, that's not the relationship. That's not the way it works with a father and a, and a child. So, our bodies are living sacrifices. And if you don't have a right foundation, you're going to have trouble in your life. If Jesus is not the cornerstone of your life, it says in 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, that sounds awfully exclusive, Pastor Dave. I mean, what about other people that believe other things? Well, do you think there's any room for that in that? I don't know about you, but I've chosen to follow Jesus. I believe every word he says. Amen. And he proved to me he's true. And you know what? You go to visit his grave and there is none. That's got to be a telltale sign of somebody. So I believe what Jesus says. That some people are uncomfortable about it. Some people might want to argue about it. But here's the thing. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. There it is. It, I made you a lovely plate and put the steak out just the way you like, a little sprig of parsley, some potatoes and veggies, and there you go. I'm not going to force feed you. Right? Amen. Tell me you don't go. Open. <laughs> why would I? Why, that's, a, that's a fantastic steak. I'll give it to somebody else if you don't eat it. No problem. Why would, I, why would I sit there and wrestle with you and watch you vomit on me? No. We don't need that. When somebody has been prompted and prepped by the Holy Spirit, they'll be starving for that steak. All you have to do is open your mouth and share the simplicity of the gospel. So Jesus is our foundation. There is no other foundation that can be laid, but you want to be careful how you build on it because you can put some things into your, into your life that will take you astray. Therefore, Jesus says in Matthew chapter seven, talking about building on the rock, Jesus tells this parable. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. Jesus teaching a parable that if you build your house on a rock, you don't have to worry about when hard times come when difficult times come, and they will come. But if you don't build your house on a rock and you build it on sand, you're going to lose it all. And I think it's a, a great parable. And the difference between the one on the rock and the one on the sand is the one who heard and did versus the one who heard and did not do. It's, it's not about believing. See, people think belief is this ethereal uh, thing you can't touch, see, identify, Belief is always seen in activity. I believe this stage is well built. And so I stand here. And I have no problem putting my full weight. I know, remarkable. I can put my full weight on it and it's very well built. Faith is something that is seen in activity. 
It's not something that's devoid of activity. And people get that wrong. So Jesus says, just in case you're wondering, you will see that somebody has their house built on the rock because of the way they live, what they, what they put their weight on, what they trust in. And that's faith. So I'm going to learn to shut up. Pray for me. Verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 6, Therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. There's more stones. More stones. Elect, precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. That's Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Psalm 118. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, like it says in Isaiah 8. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. So, more things about rocks. As though we didn't talk enough about like the, the rock. Sorry. I like that song. The chief cornerstone, by the way, is Jesus, if you haven't figured that out. Because you notice it says, therefore I contain in scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. You see, he's calling the stone a him. That's a clue. He's not talking about just a rock. He's talking about Jesus. So Jesus is that rejected cornerstone Although for us, everything that he did is beautiful and precious and wonderful, but not everybody accepts Jesus, right? Matthew 21, Jesus says to them, have you never read in the scriptures that the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? He was saying this to the Pharisees, by the way. And this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Don't you find it interesting that the scripture says, that this cornerstone is to be rejected and it's marvelous. What? This cornerstone is to be rejected and it's marvelous in our eyes. When you look at the bleeding, battered body of Jesus Christ, do you say this is marvelous? You see, it wasn't a failure. It was the ultimate victory when Jesus died. And it is marvelous in our eyes because it means that I can be reconciled to my heavenly father because I don't have what it takes. Neither do you. There's not any amount of good that you can do to <laughs> stop the evil that's inside of you and exonerate yourself from the guilt that we bear. And so that's why Jesus came. We can be forgiven freely by God's grace. And that's it. And then that's the beginning of your life. That's the beginning of your eternal life. The chief cornerstone, the Lord's doing, and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, Jesus is saying, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it, bearing the fruits of the kingdom, he means. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but whomever falls, it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this, his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But then they sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Jesus told them a, a story about some men who were watching over a vineyard, and the owner of the vineyard sent people to collect the, some cash, you know, their percentage, and they beat him up, and they sent them back. And finally, he says, I'll send my son. Certainly, they'll listen to him. And they say, this is the son. He's the heir. If we beat him up, we can take his stuff. And they kill him. Jesus was talking about himself, being the one who he came to the world, and yet his, his own people did not receive him. And they perceived that he was talking about them. Oh, that's great, but it didn't change them. The stone which the builders rejected, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. When you fall upon him, you're broken into pieces. But if he falls on you, he will grind you to powder. Do you understand when we fall upon the Lord Jesus Christ, it's only because we're broken and we realize that we need a savior. Amen. 
But if we wait until the last we take our breath and we meet him face to face, he will crush us to powder because we stand in judgment. We stand in judgment because we rejected God's call all of our lives. So if you fall upon him, you'll be broken, but he'll put you back together. But if he falls on you, you'll be, you'll be dust and that'll be it because that judgment is eternal. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. If you look into the book of Acts, you'll see this wonderful passage where Peter and John are going to the temple and they're entering into this gate and there's a man who's been laid there who's paralyzed. He hasn't been able to walk all of his life. And he's, he's got the spot, you know, right in front of the temple when people go in with guilty consciences and they're going to go before God, you know, feel like, you know, I, I need to make, I need to do penance of some kind. And so what happens is you'd have poor people that would line up like the people, if they would line up out in front of the front door and they have their hand out like this looking for some money. You see, there are people that find churches to be easy targets. Have you found that to be the case? Oh, it's true. I, th I think we scare them away a little bit here, but because we talk to them about Jesus, which is what we should do. But putting your hand out, this, this guy was looking for alms and they say, look at us. And he looked at them. And he said, silver and gold, we have none. But what we have given to you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. And they grab the guy by his hand and they yank him up in the air and he stands. And then he begins to dance. Makes you wonder how often he thought about that. And he goes into the temple, which is a place he would not be able to go because they saw him as being punished by God. Goes into the temple to worship and pray and he's, he's jumping up and down and he's got a disciple on each arm. And they say, what? Isn't that the guy? No, no, it just looks like him. No, no, that's the guy. That's the guy that's always out at the gate. It's interesting because then there's a sermon. Because they ask and they say, let it be known to you all and all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. Amen. A little bit of guilt there. Whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. You notice this apostle knows his Old Testament. Nor is there salvation in any other, nor is, th is there any other name under heaven given among men in which we must be saved. Now, I can't think of a clearer more exclusive passage to being a Christian. It, well, what if, what if I believe real hard in lots of gods? I, I, I can believe in worshiping earthworms too, but that doesn't do anything, does it? Because it's not about your faith or the amount of your faith. It's the object of your faith. And if it's not Jesus Christ, well, then you're believing in the wrong thing. There's no other name under heaven which men must be saved. Thank you, Jesus. And he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word of which they were also appointed. Stumbling. You guys know what that looks like, right? <laughs> I don't have to demonstrate. Okay, good. I, I almost did a couple times over here. Stumbling. Stumbling is what you do when you don't think something's in the way. Uh, there are times when you don't want to stumble because you're being chased by a giant rock. A rock of stumbling and a rock of offense. The only rock of offense is the one from Indiana Jones that I can think of. Uh, when a rock is chasing you, you got trouble. Matthew 24, Jesus telling a parable. He says, but if the evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying in his coming and he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and an hour that he is not aware of and cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
The people who trip over Jesus have a destiny that may, they, not, they may not be aware of. We should be encouraging them to run to the Savior while they still have time. Amen? Amen. Because time is running out. The rock is pursuing them. You see, God is speaking to their hearts all of their lives. And they don't recognize his voice, but you do. And we get such a great opportunity to share that good news with people. There'll be a time in which people will stand before the Lord. And Jesus says, there'll be those who say, Lord, Lord. So they know the lingo. Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Uh, these people talk about all these things. And I don't know about you. I, I don't know the last time I was involved in any of that. And you'd think these people got a golden ticket, they're in. And Jesus said, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. How do people prophesy, cast out demons, and not make it to heaven? Because it's not about what you do. Amen. It's about who you know. <laughs> And if you've gotten a job because you had a contact, you know what I'm talking about. It's who you know. And if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, that's it. Amen. It's not about doing fantastic things. You see, the people that go to him and say, Lord, Lord, they're calling him Lord, but they practice lawlessness. And they rest on the fact that they've done something that will get them in. That's called legalism. Mm -hmm. I did something that's going to get me in. And whatever it is you think you have on that list that's going to get you in, there is no list. It's only faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Okay. I'm trying to be clear here. Interesting. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. I want you to note the way that this is put together. He's going to talk about who we are in Christ Jesus. We are a chosen generation. Now you say, oh, well, he was talking to them back then, so he must have meant just them, right? I can't even pick a fight with you guys. <laughs> a chosen generation, actually, it means that you're an elect species, okay? You're an elect species because you've been born again, right? Not of the will of man, but by of God. You've been born again of the Spirit, and so you are a different species. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things have gone, and the new things have come. Amen. You who have accepted Jesus Christ, you are a different kind of person, Amen. essentially, from now on, because God made a change. Mm -hmm. And aren't you glad it didn't depend on you? Because yes. who here is good enough, strong enough, smart enough, spiritual enough, self-sacrificing enough? No one. Not without the Spirit of God. So, number one, we're a chosen generation. We're an elect species. God picked you to be on his kickball team. You guys play kickball in school? How many of you play kickball in school? Okay, so you understand. You don't get picked. It stinks, right? You're last. And you're the last one standing there. And the guy who just chose the guy just before you says, hey, you could have him. You see, God picked you. That means something. He chose you. And he knew what a knucklehead you'd be. And he loved you anyway. Amen. That should do something. So they're a royal priesthood. There's this separation, not isolation. See, being a royal priesthood, uh, you know, usually those, those, we think of a priest, maybe you come from a Catholic background, you think, oh, you know, monks and nuns and, oh, you know way off, far, far away, where they don't say anything for years. No, this royal priesthood means that we're, there's a separation to God, but not an isolation from other people. It means that we'll have contact with people without contamination. You see, God has called us aside to be these wonderful ambassadors to the rest of the world. 
It's not that we're supposed to be separate in a way and locked in our room, you know, because we're afraid or because uh, for me to be holy, I got to do that. It's not like that at all. It's about being separated unto God instead of doing all the other things we would otherwise do. We're a holy nation. We've been set apart by him for him. So God calls us a nation, this little bitty church. We're our own little country. Oh, that we could pass our own laws. But see, that's what heaven is for because this is not our home. This is basic training before leaving earth. And we're his own special people. Amazing. In, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You see, we're not our own. We are his special people. I don't, I don't get to do whatever the heck I want because I don't belong to myself anymore. I belong to him. I need to be reminded of that sometimes because sometimes I think I can just go off and do whatever I want. I don't have the ability to do that unless it's under Christ because he bought and paid for me. I'm not my own. Neither are you. So we're his own special people. Notice he talks all about what, who we are first, and now he's going to talk about what we do. We proclaim his praises. Why did he save you? So you could proclaim his praises. So you could talk about him. Well, God seems like a narcissistic egotist. <laughs> Have you ever heard that accusation? Is God worthy of everything? Of course he is. Well, see, a narcissism pretends to be somebody they're not to get affection, praise, and attention that they don't deserve. That's the difference. Are we clear, Rika? I'm just trying to clear that up. We are not our own. We proclaim his praises. We once were not a people, but we now are. You know that you were once a nobody. Amen. God made you a somebody, a somebody to do something. You see, we're not just like cosmic orphans, you know, results of millions of years, billions of years of evolution from a single cell that just came from nowhere and decided I'll be a giraffe. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm sorry. Too much science once, but now are a people. We're supposed to be salty according to Matthew 5. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Notice that declarative statement, you are the salt of the earth. He said, just got to make sure you're salty. You are salt, period. If, if you're in him, you're salt. But you got to be salty. Because if you lose your saltiness, you're not worth anything. Be thrown on the ground and be trampled under the foot of men. They would actually do that with salt. They would throw it on the ground. It kills weeds. If you mix it with vinegar, you can spray it on your weeds and it kills it really, really well. But then it smells like pickles. <laughs> so you are the salt of the earth. But what we're supposed to do is to be salty, which means there's a cooperative effort in which we have to yield to the spirit of God for sanctification, to be who he's called us to be already. There's also shining that we're supposed to do. He says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. There's no, don't try to be, you don't have to manufacture, you know, work yourself up into a lather to be the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Christ is gone. The spirit of God is in you. You are the light of the world, Amen. of this dark world. But let your light so shine. You see, we have a responsibility to cooperate with what God's already done. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father on the day of his visitation. Right? Amen. So we're supposed to be shiny. How you doing there, guys? You shining? A little on the low watt side? Yeah. It's, that's our responsibility. And we're supposed to be fruity. That's easy. 
We're supposed to be bearing fruit, right? He's the vine and we're the branches. It says he who abides in me will bear much fruit. In fact, apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus said. So we're supposed to be fruity. You know what fruit is? Fruit is something that somebody else eats. Especially if you're a carnivore. Fruit is produced by the plant, never for the plant. It doesn't produce fruit for itself. It produces fruit for the one who planted it. Are you producing fruit? Or are you just fruity? Are you shiny? Are you salty? We're supposed to be these things because we are those things. A city on a hill can't be hidden. You don't light a light and put it under a bushel or under a bed, but you put it on a lampstand so it gives light to everyone. So that's what we're to do. Are you out there? Are you up there? Are you being seen? Is, or are you one of those closet Christians? Are you one of them reborn Christian people? I don't know what you're talking about. You know, in the background. Anyway. <laughs> Verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. By the way, notice this isn't our home. We're just passing through. Abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage against your soul. Any of you got some fleshly lusts? Waging three people. You are <laughs> such good people. Got to work with me here, people. I'm feeling alone. <laughs> Abstain from fleshly lust. Notice what you do with fleshly lust? Abstain. Abstain. You just say no. Amen. It's good old-fashioned Reaganomics thing. <laughs> fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe... Glorify God in the day of his visitation. Well, let's open this up. In the day of his visitation, when is Jesus going to visit with a non-believer? There's always judgment day, but there's not going to be a whole lot of uh, positive uh, worship going on. There's going to be a recognition because every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Could it be he's talking about another visitation? Could it be he's talking about because you have such an impact on somebody who doesn't know Jesus that the Lord uses that like a worm? that begins to dig a hole in their heart and go, you know, that, that person is really different. They, they're loving, they're compassionate, they don't get involved in the gossip and the stupid stuff. They, and they revere God. They read their Bible in a lunch hour. Like, what's that about? Could it be that the day that the Lord comes to them and says, you need to listen to what they say, that you might be able to lead them to Jesus? And that will be the day of his visitation. I'm seeing this scripture in a whole new light. I hope you are. Amen. They will glorify God in the day of his visitation when he knocks on their heart's door and he says, listen, if you open, I'll come in and I'll have dinner with you and we'll sit down and have a great meal. You with me and me with you. That will be the day of his visitation and you might be the instrument that God uses to lead somebody to Christ, maybe today. Amen. And I can tell you what a joy that is. If you've never led somebody to Jesus Christ, some people say, oh, yeah, you saved me. No, I didn't save you. I led you in a prayer, and God saved you. I didn't do anything. Um, but you get to lead somebody before the Savior and bring them to Jesus. What a great privilege that is. Amen. So in 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, and then we are ambassadors for Christ. You know, an ambassador is somebody, you know, you send from one, one country to another to represent, and they carry the authority, by the way, of the person who sent them. So the ambassadors speak for the country. Now we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore, implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And that's what we do, right? 
We implore people because we care about them because their soul is on the line. And sometimes we get caught up in our life and we forget that this is not all there is. And eternity is really long. Mm -hmm. So I've heard. And we can't be acting like Bark Simpson. It says, I beg you as sojourners, pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Have your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak of you as evildoers, that they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. I don't want to be acting like Bart Simpson and not be a witness to my neighbor. I don't want to be, you know, getting busy doing self-centered, selfish things that degrade the name of Jesus Christ. It was actually another one of him mooning, and I just chose not to put it up, to, not to offend the people with more sensitive sensibilities. I do editorialize these things, but some things slip through. I can't be acting like a knucklehead and hoping that God's going to use me as an instrument of his light and his life to the world. So that's why it's important. And the scripture tells us that, that your conduct be honorable among the Gentiles. So when they speak of you as an evildoer, they'll be ashamed. They'll be ashamed of it because you, you didn't do that. The little girl biting the cake said, mom told me not to touch it. <laughs> well, she didn't touch it technically with her hand, which is what, what you usually use for touching. Listen, we're all smart human beings here. We know how to get around rules, right? We know what it's like. But if the spirit of God is involved, and if you're going to be a witness for Jesus Christ, you need to be all in. The volume needs to be all the way up for the Holy Spirit inside of us. Amen? Amen. Therefore, submit. Boy, that's a... That's going to grate on some people's chalkboards. <laughs> Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Whether the king is supreme, no matter who gets in. Oh, the fingernails are scraping. Or to governors. Uh, oh, not so bad with the governor. Or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. By the way, that's what police are supposed to do. They're supposed to praise people who are doing good and punish those who are doing evil. And they're sent by governors under authority. For this is the will of God that by doing good that you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free and yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So, the discipline of submission. We're to submit ourselves to the rules. Oh, boy. Yeah, we love to hear this. Should have heard the sermon on Sunday, you guys, and got to obey the rules. And the ordinances of man. The hardest one for me, people, I'm going to be honest, is the speed limit. <laughs> so I guess it's just me. Um, and, and the problem is, I, 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 you know, it's like the song, I Can't Go 65. On the parkway, you're an obstacle at 65. Amen. And I use that as complete reason for me to go faster than everyone. They just changed the speed on my road from 35 to 25. And I don't mind it, but no one but me seems to listen. Because the train station is this way, and Route 34 is this way in my house. And everybody takes my road, because there are no lights on it. They take my road to get to the train station, and they're cutting it really close. There are people that go 60 miles an hour on that road. I want to I fly out my door and suddenly go to cross the road. <laughs> Carrying a ladder. <laughs> or a landscaping tie. 
I have worse ideas. <laughs> Abstain from fleshly lusts. I'm sorry. People are flying down the road, and I'm like, really? And they don't care. So what I do is when I'm driving home, I go 25, which to the irritation of the people behind me. Why do I do that? Because I'm a cantankerous old man, that's why. <laughs> Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. I, oh, I pay my taxes not because I like what they do with them. I do it for the Lord because the Lord tells me to do it. I, I obey the speed limit as much as I can. Sometimes I don't pay attention. So if you've seen me pass you, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I do it for the Lord's sake. When the pretty lights go off behind me and I pull over, I'm not pulling over because the person who put those lights on is worthy or because they have high moral character. I do it for the Lord's sake, because they have given authority, and it all trickles down from God. And so if I don't recognize them, then maybe I got something wrong with me. You guys realize that you got something wrong with you? I don't know about you, but I grew up, nobody tells you what to do. Oh, yeah? Make me. We have a country that was founded on this attitude. I'll move on. We think submission is a hold. We don't think of it as a character quality of Jesus Christ. We think of it as somebody has us in their grips and I can't break free. Therefore, I'm going to tap out. That's what submission is. Submission is yielding yourself to God's sovereignty. For the Lord's sake. Because God created us in his image for him. And we don't have a right to do whatever we want. We have a right to do what he tells us to do. Even though it comes with authority figures and governors and presidents and Congress that doesn't seem to know what's going on. People arguing on both sides where tactics seem to be more important than content. Mm -hmm. That is something I may not be able to change unless I'm faithful in prayer and God can change it. What I can change is me. What I can do is be obedient <coughs> and I can be an example and hopefully that will lead to me sharing Christ with somebody. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And we demonstrate this by submitting to authority. We demonstrate that we believe Jesus Christ has all authority when we submit to the authorities that have been put over us. Make sense? Amen. See how you feel when we get to chapter three. We have a country that's formed on rebellion, right? And so we're rebellious. You're not going to tell me what no taxation without representation, yeah, right? And we almost feel like that's a good spirit. Unless somebody's trying to tell me to do something against the word of God, and if they're an authority over me, I'd better get my heart in line. I know. Your wives are beginning to sweat a little bit. Because you got a husband. I get it. Unless he's telling you to do something that's against the word of God. Scripture says you're to submit yourself to every ordinance of man. From the king on down. It might not be your candidate. might not be your party. might not be your plan. But you better pray for him. Scripture says pray for him. Pray, pray, pray people, pray. Verse 18 doesn't get any better. He's on a roll. We're talking about submission. Servants. How many of you are servants? I'm a servant. I happen to be serving today. This is why I don't fault people for working on Sunday. Because I do. Servants. Be submissive to your masters 
with all fear. By the way, that means respect. It doesn't mean you're always going like this and clinching because you might get hit. He means fear, honor, respect. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. Not only the good and gentle, but also the harsh. The harsh? The scripture tells me I'm supposed to submit to my mean, emotionally damaging boss? But you don't know, Pastor Dave, what he said to me. Was it harsh? Yes! What does the scripture say? I don't, I don't like this passage. But to also to the harsh. For this is commendable. It's, it's not just something you've got to tough up and do. This is something you're going to get a reward for. It's commendable if because of conscience toward God, by the way, that's a key motivation, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Suffering wrongfully? You mean the scripture says I should suffer for something I didn't do? Yes. I don't like this Christianity jazz. I mean, it was all good. Jesus loves me. This I know stuff, but this is stuff. I have to endure suffering when I've done nothing wrong, I got to take the hit when I'm not wrong. Any of you know what that feels like? Let me see your hands. Married people. <laughs> right? You could be right or you could be happy. <laughs> the scripture says that you will suffer for doing right. You didn't do anything wrong and yet you're suffering as though you did. This is not the good news. <laughs> Pastor Dave, I think you're going to get fired. <laughs> this is commendable. If because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults? By the way, it talks about being beaten. That's the kind of suffering it's talking about, being beaten. So what if you did something wrong and you got beat up for it? You deserved it, right? Right? You get no pat on the back. You get no gold star. You get no golden ticket for that. You did wrong. You got beat because you walked into it. I see people do that all the time. They call it instant karma. <laughs> so what if you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. It's commendable before God that I take a beating for something I didn't do? Yes. What? Any of you outraged at this teaching? I feel like I didn't even know what being a Christian was. I'm supposed to just endure the beating that I didn't deserve? Jesus did. Wasn't he your savior? Isn't he the one you follow? Isn't he the one you trust in? And in him... There was no sin. That's bananas, people. <laughs> bananas in pajamas. That's what that is. I'm learning to find other words to say things that I'd rather not say. Matthew 5, 38 to 43, just in case you think this is maybe an errant scripture. Maybe Peter was, you know, he ate a mushroom or something. Jesus says in Matthew 5, you have heard it said that it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Somebody pops your eye out, you get a right to take theirs. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Not to resist an evil person. Evil people is what I was born to do, was defeat these people and rip their larynx out and straighten them out and show them their fault. Do not resist an evil person. I hope you go home uncomfortable. <laughs> Do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Not that way. <laughs> if anyone wants to sue you, Hey, New Jersey, 
and take away your tunic. Let him have your cloak also. By the way, if he wants to take, take some of yours, give him double. And whoever compels you to go one mile, which the Romans were able to do, the Jews, they say, you, come here. Just like taking Jesus' cross. They could elect anybody to do anything, but it was limited to one mile. Go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You mean that my whole life is sacrificed? Yeah. That's what the Bible teaches. Your whole life is sacrificed. You see, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. You're not your own. So glorify God with your body. And Jesus tells us to do all this stuff. I hope you're really uncomfortable because I hate to be alone. <laughs> you know, the beautiful thing is, if you're walking in the spirit, you will naturally do these things. When you know the scripture in your head and your heart's given over to the Lord, you will naturally do these things. And on paper, it looks horrible. And reading it, I feel terrible. Imagine what it's like to have to preach it. I need to live up to it. Amen. Matthew 5, 43, just so you don't think there was two aberrant passages. Jesus says, you've heard that it's said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I like that. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. So the, the single-fingered salute is an invitation for blessing. God bless you. I'm just saying. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. I'm going to do good to people who hate me. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. What? Are you reading the same words that I'm reading? Or have you been so inoculated that you, it doesn't affect you anymore? I got to do that? Well, it's a nice theory. I enjoy the whole treatise of, you know. No. Because the man who built this house in a rock, it survived. And the only difference between the guy in the rock and the guy in the sand is the one who heard and did the word of God. People, this is a challenge. <sighs> For he makes the sun rise in the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. By the way, it's him who does that. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors, the worst of people, do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. In other words, do everything that I'm telling you. Not just pick and choose. You know, like an all-you-can-eat buffet. Nah, I don't think it's... Oh, I like that. <sighs> For to this you were called. To this you were called? This is what it means to be a Christian. Yeah, this is what it means to be a Christian. Well, maybe you don't want to be a Christian anymore. For this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. I thought Jesus took the hit so I don't have to. I thought Jesus was beaten up so I don't have to get beat up. I thought he took all my sin away so I don't have to deal with the consequences of my own. No. He did it as an example that we should follow. He says, you're not worthy of me if anything is more important than me. He says, what I want you to do is take up your cross and follow me. And if you don't do that, you're not worthy of me, Jesus said. What? You see, this is about our death. It's about our sacrifice. It's about not being our own. It's about being his. 
He left us an he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously. There's the key. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you've now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You know, it's so easy for us to take on the spirit of James and John, these two brothers, the Zebedee brothers, where they were called the sons of thunder. Jesus gave them biker names. Because they went into a town and Jesus said, go into town and see if there's a place where I could stay. Tell them I'm coming and, you know, I'm bringing 12 disciples and see if you could find a place. And they came back and said, Lord, they said they don't want you. They said, go away. And they said, you want us to call down fire from heaven, Lord, like Elijah did? And burn up the city? Wow. Disciples of Jesus said that? Yeah. You remember what Jesus said? But he turned and he rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. He said that they are under the influence of an evil spirit. You get it? It's a spiritual battle, people. This is a spiritual thing, and it wants to grip hold of your heart, and it wants to make you a fleshly person where you do for you. I do me, you do you. It's not about I do whatever the Lord tells me to do, and I'm going to submit to every ordinance of man, and I'm going to love my enemies, and I'm going to do good to those who persecute me, who despise me, and who use me. I'm going to be showing love towards them. Why? Because the Lord asked me to. And that's the only water that's going to quench the fire. Not fighting fire with fire. But boy, I've got quite an imagination. Because Jesus did nothing wrong and he suffered for all of your sin. And he was perfectly innocent. He left an example for us. And what an example. I don't feel worthy to live up to it. How about you? And yet God's called us to do that. And he would never ask us to do something he doesn't give us strength to do. Next week, oh, what fun that will be. <laughs> because he continues the theme of submission, but specifically from verse 1, he's going to talk about wives submitting to their husbands. And not saying anything. <laughs> so if you want to see your pastor very uncomfortable, come back next week. The worship team could come up. <laughs>